All right, well, welcome to everyone to this event at the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame. I'm glad to see you all come in. Uh, I, I imagine the weather encouraged you to come in, find some place <laughs> that's warm uh, to be inside of. Um, it's a great pleasure to invite you to the, this lecture this evening. For the last three or four years, we have been uh, annually inviting at least one uh, alumnus of the University of Notre Dame, a PhD alumnus, uh, to come back, or an alumna, uh, to give a, a lecture, um, an alumnus or alumna either of the Medieval Institute itself or our sister PhD programs in history and philosophy, theology, uh, the other many areas in which we do medieval graduate education. And that's what you're in for tonight, a very fine evening of uh, exposure to one of uh, very distinguished um, uh, members of uh, that group of, of graduates of the University of Notre Dame. Um, I'm Tom Berman, I'm the director of the Medieval Institute, but to introduce our speaker, I want to bring forward a uh, distinguished predecessor of mine, in fact, the Emeritus uh, Director of the Medieval Institute, John Van Engen, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. And I work from a few notes. I won't, I'll, I won't make this long, but I, I'll work from a few notes. I, I, wor I worked through this this morning thinking back to uh, teaching Jonathan <laughs> uh, some years ago. Uh, I, I remember when we were recruiting him uh, way back, and he comes from the Northeast, and we were going to try to talk him into coming to the Midwest, which we did. Um, and he came here, and uh, things worked out well for him. In fact, he found a life's partner here uh, who uh, late, dropped out of the shows for something other than the program after a while, but, but uh, was in a very fine job. And, uh, a very fine position and does a fine job. I'm going, to, I'm going to say just a little bit here about Jonathan, just to give you some background on what his work has been and where it's going, and then you'll understand, I think, something too about the, um, the talk today. Uh, from the beginning, he made it clear that he was interested in uh, Human, you know, the medieval story, but on the ground. That is to say, and with the people who, of power and not power, and, and and people of prestige and not prestige, and how all of that worked, and um, and insisted on working with that. And he had some comrades. Lisa Wolverton was another fine student at that time, and they were friends and shared things. But what you need to understand is that at that particular moment. Um, a lot of the attention in medieval studies was turning to religion, women, and other subjects that had been ignored up until then. And these subjects sounded like what people used to do. This, this, yes. Uh, uh, and, and what Jonathan has taken his hand is to talk about, he chose as the area he wanted to work on, Central Europe, so it, above all Germany and, and uh, Vienna and so on and so forth, and, and worked there and has made, we'll, we'll end with that, but has, made, has done very, very well there. Uh, the, in doing that, he dug into the materials for himself, dug into the materials, spent quite a bit of time over there, spent, dug into the materials for himself and found ways to object even to what the German or Austrian folks thought was, was the way one ought to interpret this material. And this has had some success, or more than a little some success, as you'll hear. <laughs> um, what I'd like to if you understand that, I think, I think you understand the way in which he works very um, finely with, with the documents and the materials, but tries to draw a story out of them. He has three books. Um, the third recent one is won the John Nicholas Brown Prize. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's the prize for the best first book in uh, medieval studies in a given year. He's recently won that prize. Um, for those of you who don't know it, I might make the uh, further uh, remark that 
I think they're all listed still on the Medieval Academy website, also for the Haskins Prize, which is sort of the, for the senior ones. It's a wonderful way to see what people thought was the best book in a given <laughs> decade or century or whatever. It's actually quite interesting to see the way it, it shifts around. Um, what I would say about Jonathan is that there's a wonderful kind of work ethic there, which also then allowed him in difficult times like ours now to get a good job. And he did it after four years of one year positions, I think. If well, I read your... Yeah, it was a couple of years and then a lot of adjunct teaching. <laughs> yeah. And but now he has spent over a dozen years at the University of Chicago. And as you probably know, he has now become the professor in Austria, in Vienna. He will be the professor of medieval studies there, uh, of medieval history, along with a person who is, is an Austrian, has been in Princeton for the last several years, and will be your new colleague. Your, your new colleague. And they together will be the professors of medieval history for that region. It, this is a tremendous honor and to have this done by by um, an American is, is really is really something. Um, to all that, and I think I've said enough, and, and, and that's why he's going to do the talk today, Corrupt Officials and the Problem of Medieval Government. This is another one of those dives into looking at what this looked like on the line. Uh, and close, you have to remember there that historians in the 19th and early 20th century thought it was all about governance, power, money, whatever. Then flipped to religion, culture, women, and so on. And he is trying to work with all of this. Certainly, one of his books includes the title of "Men and Women Doing Such and Such," uh, and 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 create an ongoing narrative about how we understand how these um, uh, cultures work. To this, I'm just going to add one little thing, which is a, a memory which I is somewhat foggy, but but came back to me when I was thinking about this. I remember I went to Chicago, oh, I should say about his time in Chicago, one more thing. <clears throat> that is, some of you know that in Chicago there's a distinguished, uh, a, a distinguished tradition there of working with uh, teaching the undergraduates by way of something that we would call something like a combination of the uh, old Western Civ thing and the uh, great books thing, and that's that's a, uh, <clears throat> a, a a way of bringing their students into the discussion uh, of in and you have run that for too long. <laughs> many, many years. This is a very important program at the University of Chicago. And for many many years, Jonathan has has had taken the lead in it, and. <laughs> Manage the battles over which book is important to read, yes. uh, and so on and so forth. But I remember something different about a book. We were sitting together in Chicago. I can't remember why I was there. Probably for one of those meetings, and and you had brought along, you had given me a, a, one of the book, your books you were working on, and you wanted my opinion on something, and so I gave it, and it was something, and. And it was a bit saying, I think, I think it was the introduction and conclusion I thought needed a little more work and a little more this and a little more that. And I can never, I'll never forget this. We're sitting right across from each other with whatever it was, a beer or coffee in hand. He looked at me and he said, John, I'll never make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> the stage is yours. <laughs> I still tell the story of the first time I drafted my conclusion for my dissertation. You just wrote, try again. <laughs> <laughs> and I went back to the drawing board. Uh, no, thank you, John. And thank you, Tom, for the invitation. I think uh, we were talking at Calum Zoo last year, and that's how this came together. I appreciate it. And Megan, thank you for all the coordinating emails. Um, it is wonderful to be back here. Uh, John's introduction reminded me, uh, my wife and I have been married 22 years. We had our first conversation right here. <laughs> in this corner, during the uh, opening uh, party of the uh, Medieval Institute. Uh, <laughs> um, but good, so um, 
the last time I gave a talk here at the Medieval Institute was January of 2015, so not quite 10 years ago. Uh, the paper I delivered was a very preliminary discussion of some of the research that would eventually lead to my recently published book about the medieval advocatus, or advocate. As I explained at the time, my interest in advocates was a direct outgrowth of my earlier work on noble families. Whenever I read about the foundations of the lordship and authority of 12th century German noble families, worked on my dissertation, I would find references to the importance of their roles as church advocates. But I was never able to find in the secondary scholarship a satisfying explanation for what a church advocate actually did, which is why I started to research the topic more intensively. Almost 10 years later, I still can't give you a nice, neat definition of the term advocatus. But as I argue in my book, there is a good reason for that. The position of advocate was remarkably capacious and gave its holder a wide range of opportunities to benefit from the advocate's general responsibilities, providing protection and exercising justice on other people's properties. <clears throat> Similar to that 2015 paper, my talk today is a series of preliminary reflections on how my work on advocates is leading me to new questions and new research. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the main arguments of my recent book, but I'm then going to shift to future plans. And I think, um, as I start to wrap my head around uh, going to, to the University of Vienna and having to do things like uh, apply for big research grants, which one has to do in Europe, um, uh, what, this might, what, what this paper is is perhaps sort of a first way to think through uh, some of the background to a grant application for some of the bigger projects that I have in mind when I get there. In particular, this problem of, of how we think about uh, the rise of government uh, and the state in the later Middle Ages. So. so let me begin with the book. Uh, Put simply, my recent monograph traces the history of the position of advocatus from the earliest known medieval advocates in the 8th century until the end of the 18th century. The geographical focus is the German-speaking lands, today's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, but the nature of the source material required me to move west to France, south to Italy, and east to Poland and the Baltic states at different points in the study. To be clear, the position of legal advocate, essentially a lawyer, which was common in the ancient Roman world and then reappeared with the reemergence of Roman law in the 12th and 13th centuries in Latin Christendom, is not what I'm talking about. My focus is different, but scholars frequently confuse the two types of advocates. And that's sort of part of what has to be teased out at the beginning of the book. The book begins in the Carolingian period, and historians have traditionally understood the position of advocate at this time to refer to a legal office connected to law courts. One of the canons issued by a papal synod in Rome in 826 decrees, because bishops and all priests are placed in office for the sole purpose of praising God and his good works, each of them therefore should have an advocate, both for ecclesiastical lawsuits and for their own, lest while they are attending to human profits, they lose their eternal rewards. Lucid and concise, the language of this canon strongly suggests that the origins of the position of church advocate are to be found in prohibitions against ecclesiastics representing themselves before secular courts. Right from the start, though, I challenge this idea because scholars have tended to rely on top-down sources like the canons of church councils and especially the Carolingian capitularies rather than local sources of practice when studying early advocates. In fact, throughout the book, my key methodological stance is that we have to focus on people, on advocates with names acting as individuals if we want to understand what this position actually entailed. Top-down sources can be helpful for framing out the basic outline of advocates' responsibilities in any given time and place, but they rarely tell us anything about what flesh and blood advocates did. While local sources of practice are not especially abundant in the Carolingian period, there is enough evidence in this material to suggest that from the beginning, advocates were not just legal representatives at law courts. They seem to have played an active role on churches' properties, protecting and enforcing these churches' legal rights. 
They were sometimes tasked with taking legal possession of churches' newly acquired properties, for example, or with collecting dues from churches' dependents. By the second half of the ninth century, we also have evidence for them having judicial responsibilities. The connection between the granting of immunities to churches and advocacy is made explicit, for example, in King Louis the German's 857 privilege for the monastery of Altaic in Bavaria. Let it be permitted to the abbot and his successors that they possess in quiet order and tranquil security all the possessions of their monastery under the protection and defense of our immunity far removed from the disturbance and vulgar action of every judicial power. And the advocates of this church should judge and bring to an end every case that has to be investigated and tried. In other words, it was not the local count who was to exercise judicial authority or ecclesi on ecclesiastical properties, but the church's own advocate. Over the course of the 10th century, the sources reveal with increasing clarity that exercising justice and providing protection on churches and monasteries' properties were advocates' key responsibilities, especially in the German-speaking lands. By the year 1000, two other trends were also evident. First, the role of advocates had increasingly been taken over by high-ranking nobles, namely dukes and counts, while most earlier advocates seemed to have been of more middling status. Second, there were increasing tensions between churches and their advocates over questions of how much advocates were to be paid for performing their roles and of how much access advocates to, were to have to church properties. This is where the word corruption in my book title comes into play. Because the entangled relationship of protection, justice, and money has been a vexed problem for all human societies. In broad terms, I define corruption as the use of an office for personal gain. But in the more specific context, context of advocates, I argue it is a useful term for helping us see just how little changed in the behavior of advocates across a millennium of European history. Even though the word corruption does not appear regularly in medieval and early modern texts, many sources written between the 8th century and the 18th offer clear and compelling evidence that people knew the difference between an advocate who did his job properly and an advocate who did not. To return to the narrative arc of my book, the growing evidence for conflict between advocates and ecclesiastical communities around the year 1000 fits into well-known historical arguments about the rise of violent lordship. During the 11th and 12th centuries, sources of all sorts, charters issued by kings, churches and nobles, narrative sources such as chronicles and bishops of Itai, letter collections, even coins. Uh, these are two coins from the uh, convent of Quedlinburg in Germany in which uh, the, the uh, convent's advocate appears on the money. This is something I'll be talking about with the students tomorrow. Um, Etc. I mean, the sources for problems between churches and advocates are just extraordinarily rich. Um, all of these sources reveal the often brutal clashes that occurred as advocates and religious communities argued over the limits of the role of advocate. Put simply, church communities considered the position of advocate to be an office, an officium, and plenty of our sources say that. The advocate was to provide protection when called upon to do so, and was to come onto the church's estates, typically between one and three times a year, to hold court and judge, uh, uh, usually high crimes in particular, of the church's dependents. That's it. That's the definition of the job. But nobles frequently considered their advocacies to be part of their territorial holdings, and did not hesitate to build their own castles on church's estates, demand various types of payments from those church's peasants, and even grant some of those church's property to their own men as fiefs. The enormous gulf between ecclesiastical and aristocratic understandings of the position of advocate inevitably sparked tensions. According to most historians, this period of violence started to come to an end during the 13th century. Increasingly, churches purchased the position of advocate back from nobles, or territorial princes acquired the position of advocate from local nobles and integrated this advocational authority into their expanding territorial authority. In both cases, the argument goes that local nobles and their followers were no longer the ones exercising justice and providing protection for ecclesiastical communities and properties. Instead, churches and territorial lords designated officials, officii in German, Amtmänner, to perform these roles. From the 13th century onward, therefore, most of the people labeled advocatus, and from the 13th century we also get the German vernacular equivalent, Vogt. These were not violent lords, but increasingly accountable administrators. 
The position of territorial advocate, advocatus terrae or landvogt, for example, became common in the later Middle Ages and referred to someone appointed by the German kings and emperors to exercise justice and keep the peace in regions where imperial properties were densely clustered. My book also challenges this standard story of the growth of government, bureaucracy, and accountable office holding from the 13th century onward. I argue that people labeled advocates in our sources would continue for another half of a millennium after 1300 to abuse their positions by making excessive demands of the people under their authority. As late as the 17th and 18th centuries, monasteries, towns, and village communities continued to complain that their advocates were demanding various kinds of unjust exactions, frequently by inventing new forms of taxation, or were issuing harsh judicial fines for even the pettiest of offenses. Uh, most of the stack of papers you see here from the archive in Linz in Austria concerns one minor dispute between a monastery and its advocate in the early 1670s. Um, there's more evidence here than there is for the entire history of Carolingian advocacy, <laughs> which is why I, I like to creep more towards the later Middle Ages, I have to admit. In the final chapter of the book, I explore the deep cultural impact of abusive advocates by examining miracle stories and literary sources from the 10th century to the 19th century that delight in describing wicked advocates who die terrible, horrible deaths because of their abuses. The best known example of this literary trope is the legend of William Tell, who assassinates the corrupt advocate sent to rural Switzerland by his Habsburg overlord. The advocate's famous demand that William Tell shoot an apple from his son's head because Tell had refused to bow to the advocate's hat is only one example of the capricious nature of this advocate's authority. This legend was told and retold starting in the 15th century because of its timeless message about what many people would like to see happen to officials who abuse their positions and treat local communities unjustly. The most famous version of, the, of the, is Friedrich Schiller's from 1804, and I argue in my book that, that that legend crops up because it's still very much relevant in 1804 uh, for the nature of office holding uh, at the end of the uh, early modern period. So I'd be happy to discuss the first half of my book, specifically the arguments about the early and central Middle Ages and the Q&A if we have time. Uh, in this talk, though, my focus will be the 13th to 15th centuries, and specifically the question of whether we really see the growth of state-like structures of government, bureaucracy, and accountable office holding during these centuries in Western Europe. Most medieval historians are in agreement that we should not apply the term state and government to the polities of Latin Christendom in the 11th and 12th centuries, However, there is a broad consensus that the explosion of administrative records from the 13th century onward across much of Latin Christendom can be taken as evidence for the growth of rational government. Indeed, it is noteworthy that for all of the ink that has been spilled since the 1990s in debates about the so-called feudal revolution, though as John rightly points out, this is sort of petered out to some degree uh, more recently, but for all the ink that has been spilled about these debates around 1000 and of the rise of violent local lordship in the <coughs> ensuing decades, Everyone seems to be in agreement that the 13th century marks a clear shift away from this age of lordship to a, new, to a new age of early forms of government. In other words, we can argue all day long about when public authority collapsed and private power came to dominate the political culture of Latin Christendom, but we all know when that private power started to yield to a resurgent public authority. Or so we think. I want to broaden my critique of this narrative in the remainder of my talk by fitting late medieval Europe into a more global historical framework. While corruption is not a topic discussed very often in scholarship in, my, in medieval Europe, it is an increasingly prominent subject amongst historians in other fields and amongst political scientists and political sociologists with historical interests. As I will show here, thinking about corruption along with these scholars from outside the medieval European field can help us reframe how we tell the history of the 13th to 15th centuries. Okay, so let me start by admitting that there's a great deal of evidence from across Western and Central Europe that supports arguments about the growth of more robust administrative forms during the 13th century. The transition from memory to written record in the 13th century, as so elegantly discussed by Michael Clanchy, was a very real phenomenon. Administrative records of all sorts 
show people at every level of the political hierarchy, from kings to small monasteries, paying greater attention to where they held properties and rights, who worked those properties and rights for them, how much money they earned from those properties, etc. This greater scrutiny at the local level was made possible by both old and many new types of administrative agents. Latin and vernacular terms for these offices proliferate in this period. Bailiffs, seneschals, stewards, judges, wardens, procurators, governors, advocates, captains, burgraves, vicars, the list goes on and on. Some of these people started to receive salaries rather than earning their income by demanding gifts from the people under their authority, thus bringing them more firmly under the control of the ruler. And as these administrators proliferated, more and more rulers found it necessary to try to ensure they were doing their jobs correctly. John Sabapathy, in his wonderful 2014 book, Officers and Accountability in Medieval England, discusses the many different forms this accountability could take. Sheriffs had to render account at the Exchequer in England, for example, and after Fourth Lateran, canonical inquisitions started to become more common, designed to investigate accusations against clerical office holders. In France, King Louis IX famously played, paid close attention to the actions of his baillis and seneschaux at the provincial level. He demanded elaborate oaths from them and also supposedly kept notes about their performance, rewarding those who had reputations for behaving well in office. In northern Italy, urban administrations tried to limit the impact of factionalism in governments by appointing a foreign podesta, an outsider not beholden to any group in the city to govern. These men were only appointed for short periods so they could not get too comfortable in their positions, and many towns introduced, introduced the syndicato, an audit, in order to assess at the end of each podesta's, to, podesta's term whether he had performed his job properly without lining his own pockets. There is, in short, ample evidence that the 13th century was a period when across Latin Christian Europe, administrations and administrative oversight grew more robust. All of this has led some scholars to make strong claims about this century's place in the arc of European history. While Joseph Strayer's 1970 on the medieval origins of the modern state has been showing its age for a while now, its argument that this century was a pivotal one for the foundation of the English state remains compelling. My favorite passage in his book, which I cite in my own, states that during the 13th century, it became clear that the basic loyalty of the English people, or at least the politically active ones, had shifted from family, community, and church to the state. For Thomas Bisson, in his 2009 crisis of the 12th century, it is the decades after 1150, when people in Europe started to show a growing interest in justice and law but also office, accountability, competence, social utility, and persuasion to tenets of collective interest that is of pregnant stirrings in a distant time that were to have a famous modern destiny. That same year of 2009, so not too long ago, I mean, people do still occasionally talk about this stuff, uh, William Chester Jordan wrote in his article on French royal anti-corruption campaigns even if medieval polities, because of the incredible disruptions of the 14th and 15th century, could not maintain the intensity of practical commitment to the prevention or punishment of corruption, the universal recognition that it was the duty of the state to establish this as a norm remained as a legacy in the centuries to come, one among many aspects of the medieval origins of the modern state. This last quote in particular brings me to my first broad critique of scholarship on the rise of government in the state in the later Middle Ages. Jordan, following Strayer, recognizes that the 14th and 15th century saw a bit of a step backwards in these developments, war, 100 years war, famine, etc., uh, the plague. Um, but he implies that once the state really got going again after 1500, some of these medieval trends influenced that takeoff. We see similar arguments in the work of many other historians of recent years who are remarkably comfortable referring to the existence of status structures of government and bureaucracy in the 1300s and 1400s. I've even seen references to late medieval technocrats on occasion. Viewed from this perspective, the 13th century planted the seeds, and even if those seeds had to remain dormant for a time, they were ready to become magnificent tall trees once modernity arrived in the 16th century. One big problem with this line of thinking 
is that early modern historians are increasingly uncomfortable with the argument that the state became a robust institution anywhere in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. My own work on advocates was deeply influenced by many of the articles in the 2018 volume, Anti-Corruption in History from Antiquity to the Modern Era. Several authors in this collection demonstrate convincingly that ideas of accountable office holding and rational government only started to gain a strong and relatively permanent foothold in most parts of Europe in the late 18th century, if not the early 19th. This certainly aligned with what I was finding in the archives about early modern advocates. Again and again, I found examples of advocates after 1500 behaving capriciously in ways that suggested they were using their positions for personal gain. They were selected because of their family connections or through patronage networks, not because of their skills or competency, and they were not at all concerned about being held accountable by their superiors. Skepticism about the early modern state has only grown in more recent years. Mark, Knight published his, Mark Knights published his monumental Trust and Distrust, Corruption in Office in Britain and its Empire in 2021. A short time before my book was published, but I did not have time to incorporate its arguments, unfortunately. According to Knights, the impartial functionary sovereign state with uncorrupt politicians and uncorrupt administrators was not suddenly born into existence. It had a long gestation through conflicts over the extent to which private interests could legitimately penetrate and control public interests and resources. For Knights, this period of gestation started around 1600 and didn't end until around 1850. And just last year, Stuart Carroll published his Enmity and Violence in Early Modern Europe. While less directly focused on issues of government and state building, it too challenges ideas about more effective statist institutions emerging after 1500. He's actually mostly taking on the whole narrative of the civilizing process, actually. In summarizing the book's arguments, he explains, first, it refutes the commonly held belief that interpersonal violence fell uniformly and consistently in the post-medieval period. Second, it challenges the widespread assumption that during the early modern period, violence was replaced by the law. This is a book all about sort of the ongoing use of violent self-help to solve most problems. He later complains that historians have, quote, continued to make outdated assertions about state power and the progressive taming of violence during the early modern period. For him, real change only begins after 1700. Thus, recent research suggests that any kind of teleological argument about the origins of government and the state lying in the 13th century need to contend with an almost 500 year gap between these supposed origins and the emergence of relatively strong state institutions in the 18th and 19th centuries. My own position is that whatever growth in administration was happening in the 13th century, it was not the foundation for later developments in the history of the state. For centuries after 1300, most government offices were filled on the basis of family and patronage, or by outright purchase. I should say this is, draw heavily on, I think Weber's patrimonial off, uh, tradition of office holding really still holds, though we don't talk about it very much. Whether we are discussing tax collectors, or judges, or local administrators, or even many military posts, there were few, if any, requirements about a person's qualifications or competency to hold that office. Many of the prerequisites for office holding that seem obvious to us today are products of the Enlightenment, not the Middle Ages. And this comes out of my 10 years of, of teaching great books and having to teach the Enlightenment uh, whether I want to or not. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, 13th century concerns about accountability and corruption should be understood within the framework of Europeans experimenting with ways to address new problems caused by the growth of the administration as ad hoc responses at the local level to a specific set of new problems, not as the basis for durable forms of impersonal bureaucratic and governmental institutions and structures. So this brings me to my second point. And this is also based on recent scholarship from beyond the traditional confines of medieval European history. While part of my skepticism about narratives of state building in Western Europe in the later Middle Ages stems from arguments about the weakness of the early modern state, an even greater portion of my skepticism comes from my reading in the Global Middle Ages on the history of government and administration in medieval China and the Islamicate empires of the Middle East. Recent studies of these regions in the period from the 10th to the 12th century, so earlier, are helpful from a comparative perspective, 
for highlighting the relative lack of strong pre-existing institutions and structures on which the 13th century administrative boom in Western Europe could have been built. This is, I would suggest, an important reason why this administrative boom did not lead in a direct line to new governments and states. Uh, so I am very much not an expert in medieval China and the Islamicate empires in the Middle East, uh, but I think you know one of the advantages of this sort of global Middle Ages term is lots of people in different fields are writing books that are very accessible to all of us, right? So uh, much easier to read a book about medieval China today than it is if you go back to the 70s, where they were also reading books about writing books about medieval China, but the dialogue is just completely different. I think there's more sort of cross-pollination of how we talk about things uh, than there used to be. And I think this is one of the real advantages of, of sort of a conception of the global Middle Ages. Uh, so not being an expert in these fields, I just want to make a few observations based on my reading uh, of, of things in these fields. So first in China, um, the Song Dynasty, which ruled from 960 to 1279, is known for its interest in state building. While Chinese traditions of government and administration were centuries old by this point, the new dynasty faced a series of challenges when it came to power. Because the preceding period had been one of rapid turnover in dynasties and a political turmoil more generally, the early Song emperors sought to implement various reforms to improve their administration. For example, they demonstrated a clear understanding of the value of a corsus honorum, of the idea that officials should all start in entry-level positions in the administration and should only re receive promotions if they did their jobs well. Similarly, it was important that those officials receive the necessary training and education. As one historian has noted, referring only to that part of the administration responsible for the empire's finances, there was, and mind you, we're talking about the 11th century here, those of you who read about 11th century Europe just have this language, and think about that. An increasing emphasis on expertise in finance, in bureaucrats holding positions responsible for the formulation and implementation of economic policy. More recently, Suki Li has stressed the broader significance of this trend, arguing the Song Dynasty was characterized by vigorous state activism. Its government showed a strong will and remarkable ability to interfere with the local economy in pursuit of its goals. Practicing bureaucratic entrepreneurship, the state aggressively sought to locate and secure every possible tax source. All of this was made possible in part through reforms to the traditional examination system, which played an important role in identifying qualified Chinese administrators. Referred to by some scholars as a civil service exam, there were questions added to it under the Song Dynasty that required people to use economic theory to solve practical problems in finance. This is around the year 1000. So this exam is not only noteworthy for the types of questions on it. This is what's really interesting to me. Already in the later 10th century, under one of the first Song emperors, the examination system was completely overhauled and expanded, which helped to create a demand for learning. This led to the opening of government schools and local prefectures and counties throughout the empire. As the exams became a more and more important prerequisite for the Chinese administration, Changes had to be made to how the exams were conducted. Beginning in 992, the names of exam takers were covered to try to preserve anonymity. However, by the year 1015, there was a growing concern that the people grading the exams might be able to recognize the calligraphy of the exam takers, which led to a root new requirement that clerks copy out all the examinations before they were sent to be graded. These remarkable attempts at promoting fairness and impartiality soon led to a backlash, however. In 1043, a group of reformers argued that these efforts at impartiality had gone too far, and that a candidate's character should be considered alongside how well he did on the examination. In other words, new officials should be judged on the basis of not only their competency and test-taking talent, but also their virtue. The details of all this are unimportant for my argument here, but I emphasize these features of the civil service exam because they provide clear evidence for the robust dialogue and debate that was taking place in China in the late 10th and early 11th centuries about the proper education of officials. At a moment in time in which we typically identify as the absolute nadir of government in Latin Christendom, the period of the so-called feudal revolution around the year 1000, the Song administration was undertaking reforms that sought to address a wide range of problems with the conduct of government officials. There was, in other words, a much more established history of thinking about the theory and practice of office holding in China 
than it existed in medieval Europe prior to the 13th century. So let me now turn briefly to the Muslim world. Another book that has immensely influenced me, Marina Rustow, in her 2020 book, The Lost Archive, Traces of a Caliphate in a Cairo Synagogue, offers a bold argument about the Fatimid period in Egyptian history, especially the late 10th and 11th centuries. She categorically rejects the idea that we cannot use the term state to refer to this policy, polity. There is abundant evidence of bureaucratic complexity in this corpus of texts, referring to her, her archive in Cairo. And it has only reinforced my belief that to call the Fatimid Caliphate anything other than a state is grossly to misunderstand either the caliphate or the way states work. The Fatimids were running an organization that should be called a state even by the most stringent definition of the term we can apply. She then goes on to walk her readers step by step through the ways in which the Fatimid Caliphate matches almost all of the features of the Weberian definition of a bureaucratic state. Her sources, which are filled with references to middling and lower officials, show those officials being regularly fired and replaced, for example. And one of the reasons this happened is that there existed, quote, an elaborate petition and response procedure aimed primarily at allowing subjects to complain about their mistreatment at the hands of state officials, close quote. Accountability, in other words, was not just a top-down practice, but also a bottom-up one. One of Rustow's main explanations for the existence of this Fatimid state is that when the Fatimids took control of Egypt in the 10th century, they were able to build upon centuries of administrative traditions of previous imperial regimes in Egypt and the Middle East more broadly, dating back to the days of the Roman and Sasanian empires. Partly this was due to the fact that new regimes tended to initially keep key officials from earlier regimes in place, so that there was not a dramatic turnover in the staffing of the most important parts of the administration tax collection always being a good example, um, the chancery though another one. But that is only a partial explanation. As other scholars have also pointed out, there was a long and rich tradition in the Middle East of writing administrative manuals. While some of the content of these manuals is similar to the Latin Christian tradition of the mirrors of princes, discussions of the virtues and vices, for example, other sections focus on the proper education of administrators, proper forms of record keeping, the surveying of land for taxation purposes, and the skills necessary to carry out certain administrative functions. One such manual, completed around 957 in Fatima, Egypt, discusses such critical topics of state administration as tax assessment, the treatment of the officials of the former Abbasid regime in Egypt, and the administration of effective justice in order to earn the trust of the Egyptian population. Like Song China, in other words, Fatima, Egypt, around the year 1000, was the home of robust conversations about not only the theory, but also the practice of effective government. None of this means that either the Song dynasty or the Fatimid dynasty ever solved the problem of corruption in office. To the contrary, both China and Egypt would continue to struggle with corrupt officials for centuries, and still do. Uh, but that is precisely my point. Compared to 10th and 11th century China and Egypt, little evidence survives from Western Europe in the later Middle Ages for comparably serious and sustained efforts to debate and institute practical aspects of office holding and governance. Although I'm really hoping people can uh, point out examples to me that I'm unaware of. Mirrors of princes where their reflections on the good and bad qualities of rulers are unquestionably numerous. As are various literary sources that praise shepherds who guard their flocks from vicious wolves and sly foxes, sort of literary texts about corrupt officials abound. And there are mountains of top-down proclamations by rulers insisting that administrators perform their roles properly. But harder to find are sources that point towards something like an administrative culture or a bureaucratic ethos, sustained by the office holders themselves, passed down from generation to generation of officials, internally internalized by office holders, and deeply embedded in local education systems. Similarly, the kind of petition and response material that was common in the Muslim world as a check on bad officials only became abundant in Europe starting in the later 15th century. It was just starting to be good work on, on early modern petitions. People suddenly sort of realized just how much of a gold mine this material is for these questions of how government worked. Um, we have many stories, such as the famous one of King Louis IX of France reclining under a tree and listening to petitioners from the higher ranks of society that point to ad hoc and informal mechanisms of accountability. But this is not the same as rulers establishing enduring structures and institutions that made it relatively easy 
for subjects of lower status to complain about administrative abuses. And yet, in the absence of this kind of evidence, the assumption of many historians has long been that the administrative developments of the 13th century must have carried on and slowly but surely created the right environment for the emergence of state-like features of government. If we're going to argue from silence, it seems to me that the more reasonable conclusion to draw from this absence is that these 13th century developments never gained enough of a cultural and institutional foothold to meaningly transform ideas of office holding in medieval Europe. As John Sabapathy has pithily pointed out, quote, better documented government does not mean better government. I might change this to say better documented administration does not mean better government, but the point is the same. The idea that Europeans, once they got started, must have intrinsically known how to create good government more easily and efficiently than other parts of the world smacks of the worst kind of Eurocentrism. Establishing and maintaining stable forms of government is one of humanity's most enduring challenges, and there's nothing natural or inevitable about those processes. And so on that rather depressing note, I'm going to move slowly, slowly uh, toward, toward my conclusion. So I always like to emphasize when I teach graduate students that critiquing past scholarship is never enough, which is pretty much all I've done so far. Um, ideally, we should also be able to point to a way forward toward a different way of framing our understanding of the past. Uh, in my last few minutes, I'd like to make a preliminary attempt at doing that. If we do our best to set aside teleological modes of thinking about the booming evidence for administration in the 13th century, if we do our best to break out of the box of government and state building into which that administrative boom has so often been placed, what are we left with? The first step to answering this question is to recognize that growing administrative complexity and the written sources that are needed to keep track of that growing administrative complexity are not inherently related to what we understand as government and state building. In other words, Public authority is not the only kind of authority that generates administrative complexity. Today's corporations produce massive volumes of documentation in order to help them run their businesses. They demand competency and accountability from all employees in their corporate hierarchies, but we don't call that government. If you've read my book, then you'll know that my favorite examples about non-governmental administrations are not corporations, but illegal enterprises like gangs and the mafia. The former University of Chicago PhD student, Sudhir Venkatesh, in his 2008 expose of the inner workings of one Chicago street gang, notes that the gang offered both protection and justice to the low-income neighborhood where it was based, which was poorly served by the police. The gang's leader required everyone who worked for him in the higher levels of the gang to have graduated from high school. He also insisted that all gang members be competent and accountable because it all, all it took was one member acting improperly to attract the unwanted attention of the police. And thanks to how successful the gang was, the complexity of its, uh, of its operations required record keeping. You were always interested in how we do things, T-Bone said, so here you go. He handed me a set of spiral-bound ledgers that detailed the gang's finances. For the past four years, T-Bone had been dutifully recording the gang's revenues from drug sales, extortion, and other sources, and the expenses, cost of wholesale cocaine and weapons, police bribes, funeral expenses, and all the gang members' salaries. A uh, 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 U Chicago economist went on to publish articles about this, calculating the profit, you know, what it took to actually run the run street gang. Let's go back to Thomas Bisson's list of the features of government that he claimed started to appear in the late 12th century. One could argue that everything on this list fits Venkatesh's arguments about the Chicago gang he studied. Even including social utility and tenets of collective interest, since in many ways the gang provided protection and justice in the neighborhood where it was based, and many of the people under its authority were quite happy to have it there. What then is missing in this passage of Bisson's book from what we understand to be government? The answer, I think, is something like the later theory of the social contract between ruler and ruled. In other words, a meaningful concern on the part of office holders for the well-being of the people who fall under the authority of their office. The idea that office holding is, the form, is a form of service, not to those above you, but to those below. This is where the gap between a street gang and the mafia and modern expectations of the role of the state becomes most evident. And all of this is where the booming administrations of 13th century Europe fall short. <coughs> 
The administrative hierarchies of the later Middle Ages were, I would argue, driven first and foremost by the ever-increasing need of rulers for money. Top-down accountability in the form of rulers punishing officials who did not do their jobs mostly came in the form of removing people from office who did not improve the ruler's income. In the vast majority of cases, rulers expressed concern about the impact, concerns about the impact of official forms of corruption did not pay much of any attention to the effects of that corruption on subject populations. And I'm not the only person who pointed this out in recent years. While this, may, while this may seem obvious when stated so baldly, I do not think this point garners enough attention in narratives about the medieval origins of government. And let me push this point one step further. As numerous historians have more interested in economic history than the history of government have argued, many of the key elements of territorial authority that had emerged prior to 1250, including fiefs, church advocacies, control over law courts, and the collecting of tolls and taxes, became over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries transferable financial assets. In other words, they could pass easily through the hands of multiple lords in a short amount of time without any concern for the impact of all of this on subject populations. When the ruler of Bologna sold the entire city to the ruler of Milan, he reportedly ignored the shouts of the Bolognese people, don't sell us, don't sell us. When the Alsatian nobleman Peter of Hagenbach was appointed by the Duke of Burgundy to exercise authority over Breisach, a town the Duke had acquired in pledge, but which still technically remained in the possession of its Habsburg overlord, he repeatedly justified his harsh treatment of the townspeople by saying, quote, you've been sold and must be made to suffer. And as noted by a colleague in a forthcoming article, when the, when the abbot of Fulda in Germany was accused of allowing his soldiers to sexually assault the women of a town during a siege, he reportedly responded, 